Hello, this is Jeff Kopp, welcoming you back to the study of the Gospel of Matthew on the way to the Great Commission. This week we will be looking at Matthew chapters 10 and 11. Here's a short introduction to Matthew chapter 10, where Jesus calls the disciples and sends them out on the same mission that Jesus had. He sends them out on this mission to spread the word throughout Galilee because he is the one person cannot do this and he is preparing them to fulfill that role when he is gone after he uh, suffers death on the cross and is resurrected. Matthew introduces us to the 12 disciples at the beginning of chapter 10 and you can see here they are listed. Jesus now calls his 12 disciples and sends them out on his mission. The number 12 suggests the 12 tribes of Israel. Jesus, the obedient Israel, is reaching God's chosen people and through them the whole world. Simon Peter heads the list along with the sons of Zebedee, John and James. Judas Iscariot, the one who betrayed Jesus, is listed last. Matthew refers to them here as apostles the official ambassadors of the king. The word apostle means one who is sent. Before sending these disciples out, Jesus gives them authority to drive out evil spirits and to heal every disease and sickness. Without Jesus' authority, they cannot carry out his mission. The crowds had been amazed at Jesus' teaching because he taught as one who had authority and not as the teachers of the law. Finally, before giving his disciples the Great Commission, the risen Christ assures them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Jesus sends his disciples also to teach, preach, and heal. As you go, preach this message, the kingdom of heaven is near. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons. They carry out the same missionary activities and preach the same message as Jesus. The messianic mission spreads to his followers who fan out into the towns and villages of Galilee. Jesus also sends us on his mission as the authoritative word of the kingdom reaches into cities and countrysides of today's world. Initially, Jesus restricts the disciples' mission to Israel. Do not go among the Gentiles or enter any town of the Samaritans. Go rather to the lost sheep of Israel, says Jesus. God's first target is the chosen people, heirs of the covenant promise. As lost sheep, they desperately need the good news of the kingdom. Though many will reject the message, as they enter the villages of Israel, the disciples are to seek an honorable home where they can stay until they leave. If any reject a message, the disciples are to shake the dust off their feet and leave the home or town. On the last day, God's judgment on them will be worse than his judgment on Sodom and Gomorrah, where the people did not have the opportunity to reject Jesus and his kingdom. The messengers will ultimately go also to the Gentiles with the saving message. As Paul writes in Romans, I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes, first for the Jews, then for the Gentiles. We go to Jew and Gentile alike throughout our world with the message of the Messiah who ushers in the kingdom. Jesus also describes the spirit or attitude by which the disciples go forth on his mission. Freely you have received, freely give. Do not take along any gold or silver or copper in your belts. Take no bag for the journey or extra tunic or sandals or staff. For the worker is worth his keep. They serve generously because they have received God's grace in abundance. They move out trusting God's provision of their daily needs. Therefore, they don't need travel with money or belongings beyond the clothes on their back. The worker is worth his keep. They concentrate so much on the kingdom mission that they don't try to accumulate possessions beyond their daily needs. 
as we go on Jesus' mission, we too can trust him to provide the resources we will need along the way. Jesus sets the example of his own mission activity. He calls the disciples on the same mission and gives them his authority to minister. He supplies instructions and promises resources. Now he prepares them for the harsh realities of carrying out his mission. He uses animal imagery. He says, I am sending you out like sheep among wolves. Helpless sheep pursued by wily, hungry, ferocious wolves, hardly a fair match. Jesus continues, therefore be as shrewd as snakes and innocent as doves. The serpent, serpent in Genesis 3 was more crafty than any of the other animals in the garden. The disciple on a mission needs wisdom and practical shrewdness in dealing with others. Planning and strategy are important. There are times to witness and times to withdraw into a more opportune moment. Yet that shrewdness never becomes plotting or manipulating. The caring disciple in a mission lives with the innocence of doves, not creating trouble by preying on others. Jesus promises, though, that the disciples will receive power to witness in these perilous circumstances when they arrest you, he says, do not worry about what to say or how to say it. At that time, you will be given what to say, for it will not be you speaking, but the spirit of your father speaking through you. Jesus spoke before the high priest and before Pilate. Peter and John testified boldly before the Sanhedrin. Stephen, courage really, proclaimed the message of the kingdom before the Sanhedrin. Paul preached forcibly in the synagogues and before accusing crowds. We too can be certain that God will provide the help we need when difficult situations arrive. How do we relate to these terrifying words of Jesus? We rejoice that he has called us as disciples. We want to go on his mission to proclaim the kingdom. But how do we understand the opposition and trials he describes? We don't want to suffer and incur the hatred of others. We fear rejection. On the other hand, in America, we haven't experienced the severity of persecution described by Matthew. Are we failing to witness boldly enough? Or does the opposition take a different form in today's world? We search our own lives and witnessing opportunities so that we may serve more faithfully as students and servants of our teacher and master. Jesus does not leave the disciples with a glum picture of opposition and trials. He richly promises his grace and help in time of need. Three times in verses 26 through 33, he offers the comforting words, do not be afraid. First, he announces that the hidden will be revealed Speak in the daylight what Jesus tells in the dark. What he whispers in your ear, proclaim from the housetop. In other words, Jesus' saving message goes with us wherever we go. That message forgives us, strengthens us, and through us reaches a world in need. Don't be afraid because you have Jesus' word. Second, do not be afraid of those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Yes, people will persecute and ridicule. Rulers may arrest and convict Jesus' disciples, but they cannot destroy God's free gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. He gives us life and health now, but more wonderfully promises life forever with him. No one can take that away from us. Don't be afraid because you have eternal life in soul and body. Third, don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. God provides for the tiny sparrows worth only half a penny each. He knows and cares for each sparrow. He also numbers every hair in your head. Surely God will also provide every daily need as you carry out his mission. He will supply daily bread physical resources for the task, 
as well as the grace to speak just the right words of witness to others. Always speak just the right words that the crucified and risen Lord stands with you in your suffering to empower you for mission. He helps us to acknowledge him before men because he acknowledged us before his Father in heaven. Don't be afraid because Jesus provides our every need. Jesus prepares the disciples for his mission by describing the true meaning of discipleship. Whoever finds his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Jesus came to earth to lose his life for the sake of the world. He lived as suffering servant. He ministered tirelessly to the multitudes, to the sheep without a shepherd. He showed compassion even to his enemies. He permitted himself to be arrested, tried, convicted, and nailed to a cross. By losing his life, he made it possible for the world to find life through faith in him. He also found life through his glorious resurrection from the dead. Disciples with Jesus' new life are free to lose their lives for his sake. We do not seek our own security or personal gain, but rather we live for others. We stand willingly to lose our lives or reputations as we boldly proclaim Christ from the housetops. The message of life in Christ is a message of peace from Christ, the Prince of Peace. However many seek to find life for themselves apart from Christ, they will oppose those who bring Christ peace. As Jesus instructed his disciples, if the home is deserving, let your peace rest on it. If not, let your peace return to you. Therefore, losing life for Christ's sake may bring divisions within families, turning a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies will be the members of his own household. When a disciple loves father or mother more than Christ, or son or daughter more than Christ, that person is trying to find his own life rather than losing it for Christ's sake. We dare not let our love for family members interfere with our love for Christ. Actually, the disciple who loses his life for Christ's sake loves Christ so much that he also loves father, mother, son, and daughter with a self-giving love. Even when Christ's sword divides relationships because people reject him, the disciple continues to proclaim the Savior's life and peace for the world. How blessed are those people who receive the disciple, the prophet, and the righteous man, even with a cup of cold water. In a world that emphasizes gaining life through success, power, popularity, and material wealth, we pause to let God's Spirit search our own hearts. Do we want to lose our lives for Christ's sake or hang on to our lives so that others will accept us? Christ did not come to bring false peace, but sword. Our faith in Christ will cause resentment among those without his faith. We confess our sin of not taking up our cross and following Jesus. Yes, Jesus sends the disciples on his mission. He teaches, preaches, and heals. He has compassion on the crowds like sheep without a shepherd. He sees the fields ripe for harvest. As the good shepherd who gives his life for his sheep, Jesus also calls 12 disciples and sends them on a mission to the lost sheep of Israel. They likewise teach, preach, and heal. He gives them his authority and instruct, instructs them how to enter the village of Galilee. Jesus prepares them for the opposition and trials they will face as they carry out his mission. He also promises them his grace and daily provision. Finally, Jesus describes their mission as losing their lives for his sake. This is a little bit of an introduction to chapter 11. We understand uh, the prophetic ministry of John the Baptist. Uh, we talk in the beginning of this chapter about John the Baptist and Jesus is uh, 
uh, singling out John and talks about him a little bit. The Pharisees also uh, become involved here as well. Matthew keeps Jesus at center stage as the Messiah with the disciples instructed and sent out on his mission. Jesus now faces growing misunderstanding and opposition. John the baptizer is in prison and wonders whether Jesus is truly the Messiah. The crowds criticize both John as too austere and Jesus as too permissive. The cities of Galilee, including Jesus' own city of Capernaum, reject him despite his miracles. The Pharisees condemn his breaking of the Sabbath laws. Jesus sends out his disciples after he has given them the instructions, and they go away to serve his mission. At this point in Jesus' ministry, Matthew helps his readers understand the relationship between Jesus and John the baptizer. We last heard of John in chapters uh, 3 and 4. After John baptized Jesus in the Jordan, we learn that John was put into prison. Only then does Jesus begin his public ministry in Galilee, proclaiming the same message as John, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. John came in fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. Jesus came in fulfillment of the same Old Testament prophecy. John's public ministry ceases because of his imprisonment. Jesus' public ministry begins. John represented the last Old Testament prophets. Like Elijah, he brought a message of stern judgment and a cry for repentance. John was preparing the hearts for the Messiah. Jesus ushers in the New Testament of the saving kingdom. He too seeks judgment, but brings forgiveness, healing, salvation in his own person. Although John had introduced Jesus as the Messiah, he now sits in prison and wonders why some of his prophetic judgment has not come to pass. If Jesus is truly the Messiah, when John heard in prison what Christ was doing, he sent his followers to ask him, are you the one who was to come or should we expect someone else? John is asking in effect, should not the wicked be punished for their wrongdoing? Was my ministry wasted? Why isn't Jesus taking control of the situation and powerfully establishing his own kingdom? Perhaps he is the Messiah, not the Messiah after all, John wonders. Jesus replies by stressing not the judgment, but the mercy of his mission. He identifies his kingdom activity with the prophecies of Isaiah. Then will the eyes of the blind be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then will the lame leap like deer and the mute tongue shout for joy. The Lord has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. Jesus says, go back and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight, the lame walk. Those who have leprosy are cured, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is preached to the poor. Blessed is the man who does not fall away on account of me. Jesus seeks to reassure John that he is the Messiah sent to save the world from sin. Preaching the stern message of repentance serves the purpose of preparing hearts for the sweet message of forgiveness through the Messiah who brings salvation. Do we not sometimes react like John? We honor God's word and seek to obey his commands. When we see a world in rebellion against God and evil going unchallenged, we expect God to act by punishing this overt sin. When the wickedness continues, we wonder whether God is truly in control. Jesus chides us gently by reminding us that he comes to bring good news to the poor, healing and forgiveness. All of us sin and cannot stand before God on our own. The forgiveness applies to our lives as well. The Messiah has come to save. As the disciples of John return to him with an answer, Jesus turns to the crowd and praises John's God-given mission. 
as the Elijah who was to come. Jesus describes John as an uncompromising prophet, not swayed by the wind or dressed in fine clothes. He is the messenger preparing the way of the Lord as prophesied in Micah chapter 3. His role was to preach repentance and prepare hearts for the Messiah. Jesus says, I tell you the truth, among those born of women, there has not risen anyone greater than John the Baptist. Yet he who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than John. Jesus may well have been referring to himself as least in the kingdom because he did not come in power but in humility as the suffering servant. Or he may have been referring to the New Testament believers who have received the complete picture of Christ's death and resurrection. Then Jesus criticizes the crowds for their attempts to control God. They vacillate between celebrating and mourning at their own whims. They condemn John for living an austere life of abstaining from food and drink. Rather than repenting of sin, they desire to eat, drink, and be merry. On the other hand, they condemn the Son of Man for leading a life of freedom, calling him a glutton and a drunkard a friend of tax collectors and sinners. They are unwilling to receive the free salvation offered by Jesus and to live joyfully in the kingdom. We confess our own guilt. Like the fickle crowds, we want to live our own lives without restraint, and we resend the message of the baptizer that exposes our sinful rebellion. We are like children in the marketplace pouting because we can't get our own way. Matthew helps us understand John was the last of the Old Testament prophets, faithfully preparing the way for the Messiah with his message of repentance. Jesus is the Messiah, friend of sinner, bringer of good news through his life, death, and resurrection. Not only does Jesus chide John and rebuke the fickle crowds, he also denounces the cities of Galilee for rejecting him despite his miracles. He singles out three towns, even Capernia, his own town. He says, if the miracles that were performed in you had been performed in Tyre or Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I tell you, it will be more bearable for Sodom on the day of judgment than for you. These Galilean cities had repeated opportunities to hear the good news of the kingdom. They also experienced Jesus' miracles and gracious offer of forgiveness. But they refused to repent, and they treated the Messiah with indifference. Therefore, they can expect only judgment and destruction. Jesus raises a similar concern for today's church. We have unlimited opportunities to hear the good news of the kingdom. We experience his healing and forgiveness. He is truly present in our midst through word and sacrament. Do we daily repent and receive his forgiveness, or do we take him for granted and go on our own way? Indifference forms a subtle type of opposition that can lead to arrogant rejection. Yet Jesus wants us to receive his salvation. Matthew clarifies Jesus as the Messiah against growing opposition. But the more Jesus appears as the promised one, the more the crowds and the Pharisees reject him. Jesus says that the Father has hidden these things from the wise and learned. Those who, like the Pharisees, are wise in their own eyes and cannot understand the relationship between Jesus and John the baptizer. They are blinded by their own arrogance, and God does not reveal to them the secrets of the kingdom. But the Father has revealed to them the little children, those who by the Spirit's work in their hearts recognize their helplessness and humbly trust the promises of God are able to know the Son as the Messiah and therefore to know also the Father. To these children, Jesus says, Come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, 
For I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. The people were burdened by the yoke of the law, which, which the rabbi spoke. They could not merit demands with its many regulations and restrictions. Jesus invites everyone struggling with sin and the burden of the law to come to him for rest and refreshment. He was keeping the law in their stead and would bear their sins in his own body on the tree of the cross. Therefore, his yoke of discipleship is easy to wear and his burden of service to others is light. How comforting these words are to us, weighed down by unrealistic expectations, heavy responsibilities, and the nagging guilt of sins committed and imagined, we cannot bear life's demands. Admitting our false sense of wisdom and our failure to shoulder our own burdens, we hear the voice of the Savior, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. We take his yoke upon us joyfully, seeking ways to serve him in home, neighborhood, church, and vocation. We receive his rest that refreshes us for daily service and await that heavenly rest which belongs to the people of God. Well, that concludes our discussion of chapters 10 and 11. Uh, next week, we will be looking at chapters 12 and 13, so we would ask you to read over those and again to use the daily reading schedule. Please join us next week, which will begin on October the 25th, run through November the 1st, and uh, we will be again discussing chapters 12 and 13 of Matthew. Again, if you need any uh, copies of anything, the reading schedule handouts, or you have any questions, uh, feel free to email me at that address. God bless you all. Have a safe week and have a good week.